and &E returns to Kennedy's Don't Cry. Fidel Castro and Cuba had been a campaign issue for Kennedy, what he called incredible Republican blunder, inaction, and failure in foreign policy. Kennedy would deal swiftly and firmly with the likes of Castro. Within months, Kennedy's campaign rhetoric was put to the test. The anti-Castro invasion of the Bay of Pigs had been planned under Eisenhower. Kennedy reviewed it, had his doubts, but approved the plan nonetheless. The American-backed Cubans didn't have a chance. They were flattened on the beach, forced into ignoble surrender. It was a monumental fiasco from start to finish. It made Kennedy seem rash, naive, imprudent, and uninformed, and in his area of self-proclaimed expertise in foreign policy. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Within months, Kennedy kept an appointment in Vienna with the head of the Russian state. Some had suggested the summit conference be postponed to allow the Bay of Pigs to recede into history. Kennedy elected to go. The meeting in Vienna, planned to ease east-west tensions, achieved the very opposite. The city of Berlin, divided between East Germany, backed by Russia, and West Germany, backed by the United States, was a sensitive spot. At the meeting, Khrushchev proposed an immediate treaty affecting Berlin and threatened to sign unilaterally if Kennedy did not agree on his terms. Kennedy was firm in his answer. Berlin would not be abandoned, and he would not accept an ultimatum. Khrushchev said that the Soviet Union's decision was irrevocable. He would sign in December. Kennedy answered, it will be a cold winter. I will tell you now that it was a very sober two days. There was no discourtesy, no loss of tempers, no threats or ultimatums by either side. No advantage or concession was either gained or given. No major decision was either planned or taken. No spectacular progress was either achieved or pretended. The East Germans fill a wall in Berlin. The decision had been made to end the mass escapes across the border to the west. the reserves and brought troops down the Autobahn from West Germany into Berlin. Americans were told, frankly, that atomic war was possible. A dictator has a uh, position that uh, the leader of a free society does not have, and uh, he can continue to push. Uh, if he miscalculates, and that's the great danger in all of these matters when dealing with a dictator, if he miscalculates the uh, world could uh, be destroyed. Uh, I would hope that uh, within the last few weeks he's come to the realization that the uh, president and the free world uh, are willing to use nuclear weapons to uh, preserve our position in uh, Berlin to ensure that the people of Berlin remain free and that we have access to that city. Some Americans took their government's advice and built fallout shelters. After months of negotiation and jockeying by both leaders, Khrushchev announced that since the Western powers were showing understanding and trying to solve the German problem, he would not insist on a treaty signature before December. The world breathed a sigh of relief. But the contest between the great powers was not over. Striving to extend their influence and increase their nuclear capabilities took a drastic step. There was still fear in Cuba of an American invasion. Russia was Cuba's ally. Khrushchev, known for his willingness to gamble, sent missiles with nuclear warheads. Rumor of their existence in Cuba had been circulating in Washington for weeks. 
conclusive proof reached Kennedy during the congressional election campaign. From the beginning, Kennedy said he must respond to the Russians. One had to act. But what were the options? He convened a special group of high-level military and civilians called the XCOM. Gathered at the White House, they asked themselves what really had changed. In an atomic war, a missile launched from Moscow is as deadly as one launched from Havana. Maybe nothing had changed and therefore nothing should be done. Military advisors said bomb out the Cuban missiles. Congressional leaders were talking military action. McNamara proposed a blockade of Cuba to prevent the delivery of any more Russian arms, a gesture intended to give the U.S. time to make its position clear and to give Khrushchev time to reconsider what he was doing. Bobby Kennedy supported the blockade strategy. He opposed an airstrike saying Sunday morning sneak attacks were not part of the American tradition. He led the way towards more moderate action. The blockade was ordered, and Khrushchev told that the missiles in Cuba must be removed. The hours crept by, the world poised on the edge of atomic holocaust. Then two letters came from Khrushchev, each offering to remove the missiles if the United States met certain conditions. The offer of Khrushchev's first letter was accepted. The United States would formally and publicly agree not to invade Cuba. But as for the demand in Khrushchev's second letter for the removal of U.S. missiles in Turkey, Bobby explained that President Kennedy had been anxious to remove these missiles for a long period, but there would be no public commitment to remove them. Khrushchev accepted. The Russian ships turned around in mid-Atlantic. The missiles were withdrawn. The bases dismantled. The United States, led by its president, had been firm, forbearing, and prudent. Domestically, Kennedy was faced with many problems, but none so difficult of solution as civil rights. It had been 100 years since black people had been emancipated, but they were not full-fledged citizens. Kennedy moved on many fronts. He named blacks to government posts. He had to use troops, finally, to get James Meredith into the University of Mississippi. And he had to find a way to keep the peace in Birmingham, a peace disturbed in great part by Bull Connor's police dogs and fire hoses. Secretary of Defense McNamara to alert units of the armed forces trained in riot control and to dispatch selected units to military bases in the vicinity of Birmingham. Finally, I have directed that the necessary preliminary steps to calling the Alabama National Guard into federal service be taken now so that units of the Guard will be promptly available should their services be required. And as violence raged, men like James Baldwin could not contain their anger. Six kids were murdered in Birmingham on a Sunday, even in Sunday school, in a Christian nation, and nobody can. Legislation, late in coming, was being pushed, but Martin Luther King and other blacks were not satisfied. They go talking about these little uh, levels of progress that we see here and there, and they say, you know, you made great progress. Aren't you satisfied? No, we are not satisfied. We will not be satisfied as long as Negro boys and Negro girls are forced to live life without dignity and without respect. We will not be satisfied. There was no easy solution, as America was yet to see.
Anxious to strengthen America's image abroad, Kennedy went to Berlin. He was pushing for accommodation with Khrushchev and an end to atomic testing. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was Kiwis Romanus Sum. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ich bin ein Berliner. It was time to get moving on the 1964 campaign. Toward the end of November, he went to Texas. On November 22nd, 1963, he spoke in Fort Worth. And as a result of the effort which this country has made in the last three years, we are second to none. In the past three years, we have increased the defense budget of the United States by over 20%. Increased the program of acquisition for Polaris submarines from 24 to 41. Increased our Minuteman missile purchase program by more than 75%. Doubled the number of strategic bombers and missiles on alert. Doubled the number of nuclear weapons available in the strategic alert forces. Increased the tactical nuclear forces deployed in Western Europe by over 60% added five combat ready divisions to the armies of the United States and five tactical fighter wings to the Air Force of the United States, increased our strategic airlift capability by 75 percent, and increased our special counterinsurgency forces which are engaged now in South Vietnam by 600 percent. I hope those who want a strong America and place it on some signs. We'll also place those figures next to it. Within hours, he was in a motorcade in Dallas. The crowds were mostly friendly. It fell to Ted Kennedy to break the tragic news to his father. A nurse who saw Joe Kennedy after his son left him found him with tears in his eyes, tightly gripping the covers of his bed. Jack Kennedy had been president 1,065 days. Eventful, critical, dramatic days. The survival of the world at stake, and he at the center of it all. Young, handsome, regal, full of life, vigor, brilliance, and wit. And now, he was gone. So much promised, so much unfulfilled. Throughout the world, he was mourned. And it seemed his untimely end was more than the wanton murder of a man more than the senseless slaughter of a president. It seemed as if hope itself had been assassinated in Dallas. Kennedy's Don't Cry will continue.